Welcome back into the mental game. I'm your host, Brandon Seho, for episode number two of season two, and this one is one of my personal favorites. It is former Steelers star Ryan Shazier. Ryan invited me to his house in Pittsburgh. I got to meet him, his wife, his kids, and spend a day at the house as we shot this amazing emotional episode about Ryan's football journey. Obviously, the big injury that happened against the Bengals in prime time that left him paralyzed, but also his comeback story. He can now walk again, and his mental health, everything that comes with Ryan's story is super empowering, inspiring, and I know if you're at home listening, you will enjoy it just as much as I did when him and I had this conversation. I had the great pleasure to interview him, but this is a powerful conversation about highs and lows in life, mental health, and what it's like to get thrown down and get back up. I can't wait to share this with you. So without further ado, here is former Steelers star, Ryan Shazier. Welcome back into the mental game. As you can tell, I am joined by a very special guest, Ryan Chazier. We're here at your house outside of Pittsburgh. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you for coming. It's a fun space. You got a lot of jerseys, some of your jerseys behind you, and then guys you played against or guys you went uh, to college with at Ohio State. A cool spot to be in. I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, first thing I ask everyone on the mental game is what does mental health mean to you? And, and people answer it in a variety of ways. Maybe it's something they discovered younger in their life or something happened to them where they needed to take it more seriously and learn to take care of themselves. But I'll ask you the same thing. What does mental health mean to you? Man, it, mean, it means a lot of different things because, you know, early in my life, I would say mental health is just constantly, you know, building your mind to be able to prepare for like adversity, prepare mm -hmm. for things that are unexpected. And then now when I look at mental health, it's just constantly just trying to uh, try to stay healthy yeah. with, with what you go with through the day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So with mental health for football and sports, it's more about being strong and just kind of focusing and just uh, filtering the noise mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. But as I got older, I just understood, like me going through this spinal cord injury and kind of changed my whole outlook on life, my perspective on life because mm – -hmm. I was living life one way, you know, so excited about the way I was playing football and so excited about the life that I thought I was going to have compared to the life I have now. So, you know, it definitely meant, uh, means two different things, you know, in two different parts of my life. You mentioned the injury, and I, I wanted to ask you about that because it is a life-changing moment, and it's one of those that if you're a sports fan, not just a Steeler fan, but around the world on Monday Night Football, I'm from Cincinnati. I covered the Bengals the last five years, so I clearly remember that day. How does that change your life? And does it start that moment when you realize this isn't, this doesn't feel right? I think that moment, uh, my life probably changed um, even a little bit before that moment, you know, because I wasn't even supposed to play in that game. Yeah. And I don't know if God was sending me a signal or whatever, but I, I was hurt. I didn't practice the whole week and just mentally preparing, like, hey, Ryan, you're going through a lot right now, but mentally preparing my brain to play or fight through an injury mm -hmm. when I probably should not play. And then once I got injured, my life completely changed because, you know, as any athlete, you think, oh, man, I can bounce back from this. I can overcome right. this. And I feel like I did bounce back in the way of being a human. Mm -hmm. But as a football player, I didn't bounce back the way I wanted. And my life completely changed because I was expecting one thing. I kind of <clears throat> already knew what the plan was going to be. I kind of already – uh, seen the vision, yeah, and you know, uh, they changed the act on me. You know, it was in the middle of the in the middle of the show. It was like, hey, chapter two, you know, and uh, you know when you watch movies, sometimes it'd be like one part one, part two, part three, yeah. And I think that was just part one for me, and I think it was it was really difficult to to deal with it, you know, going into part two and chapter two because that was just the that was the grind, just the you know that was the the resiliency that I had mm -hmm. built up from, you know, earlier, just understanding how right. to deal with adversity. 
but it definitely changed my outlook and how life was because I, I, I thought I was going to be able to play football for 15 years. Right, and, and those goals that you have as a kid to play college ball, to get to the NFL, and you were a star for the Steelers, playing a position where you hit hard. I'm sure you looked up to guys like Ray Lewis and the ones that had a longstanding career and wanted to join him in the Hall of Fame. At, at what point did you realize or tell yourself this wasn't a torn ACL, that I am paralyzed, and this isn't going to be a recovery of, of six months to get back on the field. It could be a long road. Yeah, so I, I was kind of in denial at first. You know, I was kind of dealing with stress, and I'm just a very positive person. So mm -hmm. I just the the outlook I had on it was like, man, I'm you know I'm gonna get through this no matter what. I, right. I, I can beat I can beat this, and probably I would say two two and a half three weeks mm -hmm. into the journey, I would say probably like a two and a half, probably like a week and a half into the journey. I was like, oh man, like. Yeah, this is something I'm not gonna be able to bounce back right away from. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna bounce back. I'm gonna overcome it. But right. I was like, yeah, I am paralyzed. I am messed up pretty bad. And you know, I, at that moment, I was, I was like, I, I got to turn things around. I got to really focus on how to get better mm -hmm. because I didn't want to sit and be like, oh man, I'm paralyzed. I'm never gonna get better. I still wanted to play in the NFL. I still wanted to achieve all the goals I yeah. wanted to achieve. So I just put that mentality into every single day I did rehab. How do you have that positive outlook? I'm sure shock was the original thing when you're in the hospital and, and you you have that positive mindset of, all right, this is just like any other injury. I can get back out there. But when you're in the hospital and you're there with you and your wife and your family week after week, did you have dark days and how did how low did it get for you? Yeah, I definitely had dark days because if you didn't, you know, people have their best life. I, I guess LeBron even had bad days, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, Patrick Mahomes have bad days, you know, and they're they're some of the best athletes in the world right mm -hmm. now. And if if I'm going through this type of adversity and don't have a bad day, that's that, that's unrealistic. Yeah. You know, so I definitely feel like I was I had some bad days. I had some days where I was down. I had some days where I was upset, uh, sad. But my family they understood the type of person I was. I was just mm -hmm. a really positive person. I always like to make people laugh. I always like to joke around. Right. Even when I was at rehab, I joke around and and laugh. And you just got kinda, that infectious personality. Yeah. And I think that just really helped me out when it was coming through this this injury because when I did have the bad days, my family would crack a joke or they yeah. will do something that will make me smile or laugh or they just do something to uplift me mm -hmm. and. Every single time they did it, it just kind of turned me around. I might yeah. be down for one day, and then I get a month or two, and I'm back. I'm back to normal, you know. And, yeah. And but then you know I have a down day again. It's just one thing. My family did a really good job of. They just held me accountable of the goals that I set for myself when it came to playing football mm -hmm. and just the injury. They was like, "Hey, Ryan, you say you want to get better. You say you want to do this. You want to yeah. do that." And they held me accountable for every single day. I heard you mention before first downs and touchdowns with your dad, I think, mm -hmm. in the hospital. That mindset is something that I find really cool in a moment where you could go into a deep depression mm -hmm. and could think, all right, I'm never going to get out of this. The goal is to play football again, and but you had those first downs, those touchdowns. Can you explain what those are? Because I find it really inspiring to me. Yeah, so in any sport that you play, or well, you know, I don't, I don't know how cricket and all those sports <laughs> are. But, I have but, no idea either. Yeah, but like if you play, you know, tennis, if you play baseball, if you play basketball, it's always you have to get those short-term goals to get that win, to get that big that, that touchdown. Yeah. So in football, a first down is a short-term goal. It's a short-term. Uh, just short-term happiness to end up reaching your long-term goal. So it's a 100-yard football field. If you get 10 first downs, you're going to score a touchdown in football. Yeah. Most likely, you only need about five or six on the drive, and you most likely will score a touchdown. Right. But and, and that's kind of how I really broke it down. You know, if it's in, if it, you get through each inning, you know what I'm saying, every time you get a Working single. Working as a pitcher, trying yeah. to yeah, get through that order. Yeah, once you get a single, you know, boom. Now you got somebody on base. Right. And then you keep getting singles, you're going to mess around and get a run. Right. And that's kind of the same type of situation that I had when it came to my injury. I was like, if I keep getting these first downs, mm -hmm. eventually a big play is going to happen. Eventually a touchdown is going to happen. And that's kind of how I looked at it. I was like, oh, that's another first down. That's another first down. That's another first down. Then I see me do something that I was like, oh, man, I really want to do that. That's yeah. a touchdown. You know, I really want to do that. It's a touchdown. So it just that's kind of how I really broke it down. So those first downs, what I, I would imagine would be being able to get up 
and take those first couple steps and then maybe 10 steps. What was the touchdown moment? Was that being able to, to walk? No, so it, it just it – just every – Every phase is, is is different. Yeah. You know, a touchdown for a, a parent is their kid being able to first stand up. You yeah. know, that's a touchdown. You yeah. know, they've been crawling. And it's, oh, man, they finally stood <laughs> yeah. up. You know, but then after that, it's like, all right, now they're walking. You know, so at one moment, a touchdown for me was just actually being able to wiggle my toes, to be able to wiggle my my my, my ankle. Yeah. You know, to be able to lift my knee up at a certain point because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't able to do it. Then after a while, I was walking. And then a, a touchdown went from, you know, walking with braces, that was a touchdown at one moment, yeah. to now that's a first down, and every single day I'm getting better, to actually walking with, you know, a new device, uh, with canes, mm -hmm. or walking with a walker, or walking without any restraints. Yeah. And then, you know, another touchdown was, you know, walking at a draft. You know, so that was an amazing moment. Yeah. I know I know a lot of people say that, but that was one that really hits you. Yeah. And I'm sure for you that was emotional. Yeah, it was very emotional because it was a combination of a lot of people were trying to see how I was doing, but a lot of people didn't know how I was doing. And I felt that was a good way of, you know, letting people know that I'm doing a lot better. Yeah. But then also just to me that was just thank you for all the prayers mm -hmm. and all the support because the one thing that I really love about sports is it doesn't matter if you like the Cincinnati Bengals, you like the Browns, or you like the Steelers, or the Ravens. When it comes to football, they all, all, all hate each other. <laughs> yeah, but when especially it comes, the AFC North. <laughs> yeah, but when it comes to just life and when it comes to things that are more important, mm -hmm. you know, people rally together and just want the best for others. And to me, that really meant a lot that people were praying for me, people were wishing the best for me and supporting me. And I just want, to me, that was like a thank you and just letting mm -hmm. people know that I'm getting better. It is incredible how the football community does come together, not just during the season when everyone's having fun rooting for their team, but when something tragic does happen. Obviously, you went through physical therapy and had to get, get back to using your legs and your feet and your toes. Did you have to go to just therapy and have help with your mental health? Did, did depression sink in where... Or has it ever in your life as therapy been a thing for you? Yeah, so I used to... I actually uh, went through the therapy... Uh, at first, when I was at Ohio State, okay, they, they had a they have a, a great department for yeah. sports psychiatry. Yeah, yeah, they had sports psychiatry, and and to me, it really it helped out a lot, you know, and because I was going through a lot, and then mm -hmm. one of the coaches was like, "Hey, Ryan, we recommend you go go to a sports psychologist because, I, you know, I just had a lot going on with my girlfriend, and then yeah. and just a lot of adversity, just a lot going on, and then also being at Ohio State, everybody's wishing you know the best for you, but also it's a lot of pressure. Playing at a school like Ohio State, playing at a school like Georgia, Alabama, yep. those big time schools, because all people expect out of you is winning. They don't expect yeah. anything else, you know. So, and that's what you ask for. So, I, my first time was going to Ohio State. I had sports psychology. Uh, I went through sports uh, psychology, and I had sports psychologists, and they they helped me out a lot. And then I end up. Uh, while I was in the NFL, I actually didn't talk to nobody that much. And I, I wish I probably did, you know, a little yeah. bit more. But after after the fact, I would talk to somebody here and there. With, uh, the Steelers have a good a good guy named Dr. Nash. I would talk to him okay. and there, here and there when I was going through my injury. But one thing that I, I think I did a really good job of is when I was actually going through something, I, I had a tough time. I always talked to my family. I always talked to my best friends. Mm -hmm. And one of them is like a psychologist. He's not, that's not his job, but it just the way he understands how to, you know, be unbiased and give mm -hmm. just authentic uh, support really helped me out yeah. a lot. And he was kind of like, he's, he's still kind of like my psychologist. I, I could talk to him all the time. And I just talk to my wife and my, my family. And, and then when I would have times when I would get depressed or I'd be sad, I'll let them know. And then it's, if it was just too much for them, they'll like, hey, Ryan, I think you should talk to somebody else that's mm -hmm. unbiased. And, you know, I would here and there. But uh, I definitely needed it uh, the more and more uh, I was dealing with my injury. You mentioned your wife. And, and I've heard stories before of you two in the hospital and you kind of giving her an out, which – I find you know hard to hard to believe when you're in love with somebody, but then there's an injury, like you have mentioned previously. Of you're gonna have you might have to take care of me yeah. forever. What was that that conversation like? Because I think it says a lot about both of you that you stuck together, and obviously you're walking again. Mm -hmm. You're being able to enjoy life, but well, that's a tough conversation to have. Yeah, I mean, I th I think if I gave my wife that out now, she'll take it. You know, no, I'm messing around. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing around now. Nah, but the thing is, she she was just she, she's just a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, at the time she was my fiance. 
and we were 25 years old, and I said, hey, Michelle, you know, I, I understand that, you know, you never planned for this. You, you never thought that you're going to have to deal with somebody that's going to be paralyzed for the rest of their life. You you know, we had a plan on what we wanted to be, mm-hmm. and you're a beautiful, beautiful woman. You don't have any kids. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to be here. You know, if you, if, if you uh, move on, nobody's going to look at you uh, like you, like you're wrong for right. that. And she was like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm in love with you. And that day I said, I'll be here with you no matter what. And she literally has been by my side every single day. And, you know, to this day we have arguments over little things that anybody has arguments right. over, like, uh, you know, fixing the couch and you know, <laughs> taking out the trash and stuff like that. But to me, she, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. I, my my football, my whole football career got better because she came into my life. I was playing well, mm-hmm. but I was more consistent when she came into my life. And then my 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 whole life, when it comes to rehab and just everything yeah. I'm doing, it's gotten so much better just because she's been in my life. So I'm I'm just truly thankful just to have her as my as my backbone. You mentioned family and friends. Obviously, she is your best friend. She's your wife. Just having the community around you and the family around you to listen when you're going through shit is so important, even if it's not a therapist. Now, mm-hmm. I, like, I'm a big fan of therapy. I think you would agree it does yeah. help. But not everybody is ready for it right away. And, and just being either the person that listens or ha- knowing that you have somebody to go to, it, it makes a huge difference, right? Yeah, it makes a huge difference. So with Michelle, the thing that's so amazing about her is that Sometimes she's willing to listen, and sometimes she's like, "Hey, Ryan, like, I think it's a little bit above my head, my pay grade." Yeah. You know? And and to me, I think it's very, very important because I know me personally, I probably wouldn't be a great uh, therapist because you know I always try to, "Hey, this is a solution. This is a solution." Yeah. And a lot of times when you're going through something, you don't need a solution. You just need somebody to listen, right? And just give you like, "Hey, Ryan, this is what you're going through right now. This is this is a tough time, but you can, you know." These are way they actually know ways that kind of help you get through it. Right. To me, uh, I always tell them like, "Hey, this is what I think is best." You know. So I think my family is just awesome because they understand what I'm going through, and they and they know how to be just you know an ear on the wall. They know how to just be somebody just that I can talk to or how mm-hmm. to come for me. And they and they since they're my family, they understand when Ryan's like this, something's wrong. They know they know your what what triggers you or your coping mechanisms that are negative. Like, yeah. like for me, like I've been, I've been sober now for about two months. Like drinking was a huge thing where I would just go out and get effed up and like cover up my problems. And when my friends saw that mm. they obviously knew that something was going on. So that's like so important that your friends are there uh, to notice that. What well, it was, there some things for you that they noticed were like, all right, we need yeah. to talk to him, get him out of that phase. Yeah. No. So one thing that my wife knows with me is, when I, when I just stay up extremely late, like if I just stay up extremely late, you know, like watching movies mm-hmm. or on the computer or playing a video game, just extremely late, like, like I might be up to like one sometime, but that's not that's late. But like right. when I'm talking about like I'm up to like three, four in the morning, right. then my, up. she knows she's like yeah, Ryan's not in his right mental state right now. He needs like, I need to talk to him and just see what's going on. So like I'm gonna be honest, uh, come like I'm actually going on a vacation tomorrow. Yeah. You know, because uh, just this last week, I was actually been going through some stuff, just mentally. Mm-hmm. You know, and my wife was just like, Ryan, I feel like you're just not in the right space right now. And I think it would be a good time if we just, like, get away. You know? And, yeah. You know, and I think it's important to have people in your corner that knows, like, hey, man, you don't seem like yourself right now. You need to get, you need to figure sure. things out. And, and to me, I think it's, it's really important that, you know, you have people in your corner that understands that. Well, thanks for allowing us to come. You just, just for everyone at home watching, listening, you got home, what, 30 minutes before we showed up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you're flying out to where tomorrow? Oh, we're going to Nashville. Oh, that'll be awesome. Nashville yeah. is definitely a, a place to relax and get away. Uh, I'm going to ask you this, and I don't know if it's crossing a line or too far, but have you watched that play? And is that hard to even talk about that night or, or see things if you're on Twitter scrolling through and that pops up? Yeah, so I actually watch that play a few times because sometimes when I'm actually going through a tough time, I'll look at my highlights and just to see, uh, like, all right, Ryan, this is the guy that you used to be. And, like, it kind of motivates me sometimes. And, like, I agree. You know, it's like, all right, man, Ryan, like, 
you as a dog, like you continue <laughs> to be a dog. You know, so I look at that sometimes. But then, you know, sometimes they they'll have like Ryan Shazier, you know, uh like tribute and stuff like that. So like I'll watch like it's, it's a, there's like a bunch of different highlight tapes. Yeah. You know, so like I'll watch one and then, you know, they'll show the play and then it's just like, you know, it's at, before when I used to see it, it used to make me cry a little bit. It was a little bit tougher for me. Mm-hmm. But now that's a point in my life. Like it's never gonna change. I can't right. I can't press the rewind button and change it. Yeah. You know, so I think now that just being able to talk about it a little bit more, it, it allows me a little bit more freedom. But at the end of the day, it still hurts because at the end of the day, I, I've been playing football since I was five years old, right? And I played every year until I was twenty five. So it, it it definitely hurts to know that I would never be able to go back out there and play the game of football again. Did you cry and get emotional seeing that play because of? Like, I, I'm not going to be able to go back. Like, you just missed football. It was a combination of I, I just missed football. And most people, when they get fired from football, majority of people, they say, hey, you're not good enough anymore. Or, hey, you mm-hmm. know, for some odd reason, you know, they keep trying, but they're just not healthy enough anymore. Yeah. I never even got the opportunity. You know, right. I never even got the opportunity to go back out there. It's like, hey, let me give this a shot. You know, I just, I just never was able to even pit. I never even was able to pit shoulder pads back on, or right. like, I, like I might throw my helmet on here and there. And I was like, man, my head was this, like my head seems bigger now, or whatever. <laughs> but it just, I never really got the opportunity to, like, get any closure. Right. You know, so it made it. it you made were it, forced to move on. Yeah, and it, it made it really tough for me. And then, you know, another thing that made it tough is, you know, people would come to me like, hey, Ryan, man. You you were so great. Are you can you are you gonna try to keep playing or or, or uh, I wish you still playing. And it's like you know I wish the same thing sometimes, but and day I, I I can't you know and so like those are the things that will make it really tough for me and mm-hmm. and uh, but you know it's, it's life. I can't I can't change it now. Being from Cincinnati and covering the Bengals, uh, obviously I, I told you before we started rolling on this podcast that like that moment is something that I'll never forget. I, I want to ask you about. Damar Hamlin's injury and seeing that as, as millions and millions did same scenario prime time in Cincinnati which is just crazy that it was on the same field I was actually watching that game with one of Damar's teammates from Pitt and we saw him go down thought it was a routine injury or like you know, something quick yeah. and then they come back from commercial and I'm sure your reaction was like both of ours where it was okay this is this is serious but for someone that's not only gone through a traumatic injury, but on that same field and what looked like a routine play, like when you were making a routine tackle, what was your reaction to seeing that seeing that injury? I'm I'm not gonna lie. When I watched that, it was almost like surreal to me because I was like, "Are you? Are you?" It was a Monday Night Football game. It happened to him in uh, on the same field. Mm-hmm. It was probably like a month after my injury, and it was just like it was just it hit way too close to home. And the biggest thing, I, I was just praying that everything was okay with DeMar because I remember the last time people were, were – somebody was in that situation in front of the national media. It was just a scary moment, you know, and that guy was never a play again and it was me. And I was just wishing and praying that DeMar didn't have to go through the same thing. But it definitely it was a dark time for me. It was hard for me to actually bounce back that week. You know, I, I didn't really want to talk to too much media about it because it was just, it was just tough. It was yeah. something that I didn't – want to you know talk about because I knew people were going to try to compare us and ask me to talk about it as well and you know now I understand that I'm I'm somebody that people can talk to about how uh, how a situation like that feels or how one may be thinking in this type of situation but and day I'm just happy to see that DeMar's doing well because you know I know there are so many people praying for him and, mm-hmm. and West wishing the best for him and and the, all I can say and all he probably can say is thank you because, you know, and they, people don't have to do that. And that's just out of the grace of their hearts. And we really appreciate it. Right. And you two are probably the only two, uh, let's pray, that they are going to experience a moment like that when you're playing the game of football and an injury like that. Have you two formed a friendship? Have you been able to meet him? Did you know him prior to Yeah, to I, knew, that? I knew him a little bit prior to it. But uh, I, DeMar – that I know of haven't been back in Pittsburgh yet. Yeah. And um and I actually been traveling a lot. But we have contacted each other on social media and he said when he gets back to Pitt we'd like to connect and, you know, 
uh, grab a bite to eat and just chop it up and just uh, talk a little bit. But I, I did meet him a few times beforehand when he was at Pitt when I was yeah. playing for the Steelers. Oh, yeah, because you guys share the same facility. Yeah, yeah. And so you see him there uh, all the time. Yeah, I, when I covered the Bengals, I was pretty tight with Tyler Boyd. So obviously, like a lot of Pitt guys, Tyler was in Cincinnati that week going to visit him at the hospital. And I'm hearing things of, hey, he's he's – He's talking or he's able yeah. to read a message. And then when it came out publicly, it's yeah. like just the way we talked about it before, the way the community, not just in football, but now across mm-hmm. the country rallies behind a guy like Damar, a guy like you. Um, can you feel that love when you're going through something like that? You definitely can feel that love because just people from all over the world just send you letters, they send you messages and just talk to you. And then social media is even bigger now than it was when I got injured. Right. And so things spread rapidly. You can, I can post, I love you on something. If, if the right person sees it, it can, it can hit a hundred million people. Right. You know, so to me, it's just amazing how things spread so fast, but it's also, uh, you feel how much love you're getting. Whenever you're getting a lot of love, you understand that people are there and supporting you, but also it feels the same when you get hate too. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to, to know that people are supporting us and supporting DeMar, especially in, in such a uh, traumatic time in, a lot, in our lives. Obviously, your, your family, friends, old teammates, current teammates, coaches reach out to you um, throughout that process during your recovery. Is, is there one that kind of stood out that, that wasn't in that group where you're like, not starstruck, but like this person's reaching out to me or I'm really thankful that this person I've never met gave me a call. You know, so it's, it's a few people that I definitely met through the process uh, when I was actually going through my injury that I was like, man, this is pretty cool that they know who I am and just spend the time to, to talk to me. But it was even after my injury, after I'm not in the league anymore and I would just go to events and there'll be people that you'll never know that would know my name. Like I remember I went to somewhere and John, John Bones Jones was there and he knew who I was. And he was like, man, Ryan, like I lo- used to love how you played and I-, I love how you was able to bounce back. And, and you know, like Tom Brady, I don't know him personally, but I played him a lot of times. Right. And, you know, he wrote, he sent me a jersey and he, he didn't have to do that, you know, and just, you know, like, Talking to, you know, guys like uh, LeBron and just uh, Dwayne Wade. You know, Dwayne Wade, we, we swapped jerseys when I was going through my rehab and things like wow. that. So, you know, it was just um, just really crazy how you just build connections with people like Mookie Best. I built one with him. Yeah. And it, it, it was just – it's kind of crazy how you just build connections with people and they respect what you do, but they also respect how you was able to bounce back from something that most people thought you would never be able to. That's incredible, and it's there's only certain people in the world that understand when you're an athlete, the pressure you feel, the stage you're on. Like you mentioned, now that social media is a thing, the hate you get, the love yeah. you get, it's a hard thing to balance. Um, thank you, one, for opening up on all that. I know the injury can sometimes be hard to talk about. I want to get into uh, some, some positive things, fun things. Um, number one, uh, your book, Walking Miracle, you wrote that, and – Tell me your mission behind that, wanting to inspire, give people a kind of behind-the-scenes look of, of how you were able to bounce back for, from what happened. Yeah, I wanted to inspire people to let them know how I was able to bounce back, but also I wanted to kind of give them a uh, a guide of how to overcome adversity. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people, everybody goes through adversity, every single person. It doesn't matter who yep. you are. Everybody goes through adversity, but the biggest thing is some people just don't know how to overcome it. And some people just don't know that they've been overcoming it their whole lives. They just don't know how to pull it out of them. Yeah. And the biggest thing that I want to tell people in my book is that, hey, we already have it in us. We just have to be able to pull it out and just understand mm-hmm. that we always have to be positive in, in that. And I think that's one thing that was really important to me to share with people. And I was really excited about it. Finding like what you already have inside you is such a big key. I mean, therapy, medicine, very, very big key to my mental health and a lot of people watching and listening, their mental health. Um, but obviously, like, it's you. You have yeah. to make the decision to want to get better, yeah. feel better, take control of the situation. The Ryan Shazier Fund, walk us through that because I just think it's incredible. And a lot of people, when they go through something, they want to help people that might be going through the same thing. So for you to help fund and and be able to just raise the hopes of young people and other people going through the same injury you suffered, why did you want to do that? Because I was going through my injury, and I know I was getting a lot of support from the NFL. I was getting a lot of support from the Steelers. 
And it was just crazy to me how I was able to recover, but there was a lot of people that was on the journey with me, but I constantly seen them kind of getting left behind and not getting left behind in the fact that like people don't care about them, but just they weren't able to get the same amount of rehab as me. They weren't recovering right. the same pace as me. So I started to ask a lot of questions, which my wife say I ask too many sometimes, but <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I do. And when I, when I, some of the questions I started asking was like, Hey, how come this person um, is not getting as much rehab? How come this person uh, is not recovering at the same pace. Why, you know, I just, so I started asking those questions and then I started getting answers like, you know, their insurance wouldn't cover it or they just, you know, they don't have the means to continue to keep going. Right. And so I just was like, hey, how about if I start a fund that allow people the same opportunity to get independence, to allow their families to have support when they're going through a tough time like this because when you're going through this, you're not going through this alone. Michelle is... Having such a, uh, having just as much of a tough time as I was mm-hmm. dealing with my injury as, as she had mentally taking care of me and just being a caregiver. So I just wanted to be able to provide support for the families and the individuals that's going through the, this injury and the, the spinal, cord, uh, spinal cord injuries. But then also I just wanted to see down the road if we could potentially change up some laws to allow people to get more, more services mm-hmm. uh, when they're going through this type of stuff. I think it's amazing work, and obviously a lot of people agree. And you're very active on social media um, and do a lot of events. Thankful that you came on The Mental Game today. Is there a a moment that that sticks out when you meet somebody that you've been able to personally help that has gone through an injury or maybe a speaking engagement or a charity function where you're like, that that conversation really, really hit me? You know, it was – there's there's a guy that that we help with the fund. And he, he, him and his wife went through, I mean, him and his family went through a really tough time. And I remember the first time I, I met with him, he was just like, man, I'm, I don't know if I can keep doing this. I, I just, this is not, this is not for me. I can't deal with this injury. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can keep fighting. And, you know, we started to spend more time with each other. We put him, you know, he was spending time with other individuals through mm-hmm. the fund. And now he's one of the biggest advocates. And now he actually is one of the, the best people to talk to when it comes to dealing with a spinal cord injury. Wow. And it just shows how, you know, coming into somebody's life and just giving them options to, to get better, how it can tra- really help and change people. And I, that's one thing I wanted to start doing. And, and I thought, you know, that conversation and just the fun is, is why I'm doing this. And uh, it, it's, to this day, uh, that person will always be really dear to my heart. It's awesome. That's good to hear. And you love seeing like what the hard work you put in to help other people mm. pay off. I no, <laughs> I was nowhere near on the stage that you were at um, when your injury happened and the way you've been able to give back. But when I get messages or emails and or people that you know write feedback about the podcast, it's like, hey, this like kicked me in the ass to finally go to therapy or. Hey, I, I I was suicidal like you were, and check yourself in. It it hits more when it's when it's personal to you, and so it's it's really cool to hear stories like that when you're able to help others. Yeah. Favorite football memory? Is there a favorite play that, that you have, or a favorite game you look back on, either high school, Ohio State, Pittsburgh? Oh man, my favorite football memory. Well, this is a tough one. Um, so my favorite football memory might have been versus Cincinnati Bengals. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I'm sure you won the game against my team, right? Yeah, and it, it was <laughs> it was uh, in the playoffs when Jeremy Hill uh, and I ripped the ball from Jeremy Hill on like that ten yard line. Then we come down and uh, kick the game with a field goal to win the game. It it was it was a, just a really cool moment because we made it to the playoffs and basically everybody kind of counted us out that game. And all Jeremy had to do was you know hold on to the ball, and uh, and I was able to actually whip it out of his hands, and it was. It was a, a crazy moment, you know. So I was, I was uh, to this day. That's probably one of my favorite movies, uh, one of my favorite memories. And the thing that was kind of cool was like me and Jeremy trained with each other the whole like all season yeah. and everything. So it was like I kind of knew him. And then to to do that in in the game, uh, my my second year in the league, it was it was kind of cool. For everyone at home listening, you can't see the smirk that I have on my face as he's telling that story because if anyone's a Cincinnati sports fan, that yeah. was. Probably one of the top five worst like moments in Cincinnati yeah. <laughs> sports history, and here you are saying, "Hey, that's the best moment of yeah. my career." You know, but that was one of the best moments of my career. You know, so <laughs> I, I'm just really excited about it. I'm glad we can I can laugh about that now because uh, Super Bowl run with Burrow helps. But that was a night that stood out. I mean, that was 
it, can we go into that game just for a sec? Because, I mean, that was one of the craziest things I've witnessed. Obviously, Dalton's out. A.J. McCarron's starting. Touchdown to A.J. Green. That gives the Bengals the lead. Then there's the the drama between coaches and Bengals defensive players yeah. and flags. Like, I know AFC North football and Bengals versus Steelers is like that to a certain degree. But that had to be the most heated you've seen that rivalry get. Yeah, no, that, that rivalry was definitely heated. Even when we was playing in the regular season games, it was heated. Because you guys had a really good team. Andy Dalton, that, I think that season, he was like one of the front runners for the MVP. Mm -hmm. Then he ended up getting hurt. Yeah. And uh, he got hurt versus us. I think uh, Cam... Cam Artua t sacked him and he hurt his, uh, his thumb, right? Yeah, yeah, his thumb, yeah. Yeah, he hurt his thumb and in, in, in the play he got sacked. And it just that 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 rivalry was really heated. It just it was like no love lost at all in those yeah. games. And you know, I know people in Ohio love me as a, a Buckeye, but when I played for the Steelers, they hated me. So it was just that was a really uh, hated like a crazy moment because Cincinnati that year they had a good year, and I, I think Andy could have came back. You know. If, you guys got further into the playoffs, but yeah. it was just, I think we had a really good team that year too. And we were just really excited about what was to come. And uh, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. That you ripping the ball out that moment, one of the most heartbreaking moments for me personally, <laughs> yeah. but just in that crowd in a hostile environment and just, it was pouring down rain. Yeah. It was like a slug it out, yeah. slug it out game. And to, to not win it on a defensive play, but to give you, a really good shot. You know the kicker yeah. you have. You know the quarterback yeah. and the offense you have. It just felt like in your gut, probably, oh shit, I just sent us to the to the next round. Yeah, it was it was crazy because also in that game, that was like the the that was like the making of Boz, like the, of Boswell, because Boz came in the middle of the season. Oh yeah, yeah. He came in the middle of the season, and then like when that happened on the sideline, he was like, "Hey, don't worry, I'm gonna make the field goal." Like he told us, he was like, "We're going to the next round." Like it was like no, like. No hesitation. He's yeah. like, hey, hey, he's like, don't worry about this. We're going to the next round. And then he incredible. went out there and, and drained the kick. And it was just like from that moment on, he's probably been the Steelers' best kicker of all time, but one of the best kickers the Steelers ever had. I think he has right. the highest field goal percentage in uh, Steelers history. Well, he's, just in the AFC North, him and and T Justin Tucker are, are two of the best. Yeah, yeah. incredible. Um, yeah, man. Just looking back on football memories, there, there's so much fun to talk about games like that. Moments like that. Uh, do you watch football every Sunday? Do yeah, you? I still watch football every Sunday. And, you know, uh, while I was going through my injuries, like I'll watch a little bit here and watch a little bit there. But uh, the old, like the more and more I've been getting out of my injury, the more I actually been sitting down watching games. And I remember when I was watching the uh, AFC, was it AFC Championship game? Yeah, AFC Championship game this year. And I was oh. like, man, I know, I know it was a tough game for the Bengals fans again, but like, I was like, man, this is such a great football game. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just, to me, it was, at one point I was so, like, hooked on being a player that I wasn't even enjoying it as much as a fan. Right. And then now it's like I can actually enjoy it as a fan and just really, like, admire and just praise the guys, like, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrows, Jamar Chases, you know, Joe Mixons and those guys, and, you know, Juju, even at the, at the, the Chiefs at the time. Yeah. It was just to be able to praise those guys for how – how well they're playing a the game, how efficient they're being, how you know precise, and just really appreciating them as athletes. And mm -hmm. that was that was a, you know, it's it's really cool now. I can actually sit back, watch the game, and just like, hey man, I have no obligation to this right, right. now, you know. And it, it feels good, you know. Before I always was like, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, mm -hmm. I, you know. And and now to me, it's just I'm happy for the guys out there, and I wish them the best, and you know, things happen. For me. My not the same as obviously being an NFL player, but the Bengals Super Bowl run that was my last year being a reporter covering the Bengals, and so that AFC Championship two game two years ago, that AFC title game, it was one of the coolest things ever. I'm sitting there interviewing Joe and Jamar on the field, and it's a, you know I see people that I went to high school with in the stands in Kansas City. I'm like this is amazing, and then this following year I got to be a fan for the first time since college like yeah. of my teams and so I drove and froze my ass in Buffalo yeah. crazy game won that one then drove to Kansas City fun game obviously the not the result that Cincinnati fans wanted it's cool to have that that different perspective and so I think both of us get to experience different things now on the other side um last thing I'm going to ask you and I'll open the floor if there's something that I missed 
But what would be your advice? Um, usually when I get a football player, an athlete, I would ask them what their advice is to make it to the NFL, the NBA. But I think I'll give you the choice. You can answer both. But I think more importantly for someone that, that is playing a sport they love and they go down and, they, and there is a, a, an injury that isn't a broken hand, broken arm, what advice would you give them as they start rehab or deal with that injury? So the biggest, the biggest advice I have anybody that's going through something is whatever you're going through right now, just understand that's a moment in your life is not your life. Mm -hmm. And most people feel like, oh, my life is over. Like, I did, like my plans are over. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And most people f f uh, forget, like, hey, this is just a moment in your life. This, your life is so much longer right. than, than the moment that's going on right now. So you just have to understand where you want to be at in life. And if you get to play again, cool. But just keep working every single day as if you want to, as you're still playing. Work every single day as you're still trying to be the best person that you're trying to be. Mm -hmm. Because just because you got hurt, just because what you lost is gone, you can still be a better person than you were before. Yeah. And a lot of people fail to realize that. And I think that's something that I fail to realize a little bit when I was going through it as well. I was staying positive, but I still was like, oh, man, the best version of me left a long time ago. And God has a bigger plan for us, mm -hmm. us all. And we just got to understand that that version is still still to come. And you just got to keep pushing for it. I think that's great advice and a great way to look at it. You know, I think a year ago, I can't believe that's, you know, where I was, where I was suicidal and I checked myself into a mental health hospital. Um, it's crazy how, like you said, God has a plan. You figure things out and that is just a moment in your life. I think that's uh, great advice. Anything mental health wise I'm missing you want to hit on? You know, to me, the biggest thing mental health wise is, you know, everybody that's going through something, you know, you're going through something. If you on a routine and your routine is off and you know, like every single day is like, why am I doing this? Why? Like right. if you, if you have those questions, Talk to somebody that's important to you that you know that you can be real with and just say, hey, do I feel a little off? Because if, you think, if you're thinking you're off, people around you probably feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And make sure you just get checked out. And, because once you, once, you get, once you get everything checked out, you, you're going to understand that you have the, the better side of you on the, other, on, uh, on the other side of the door. You just got to go through it. You're just scared right. to go through it right now. You know? Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much. I no appreciate problem. it. No and we will see everybody right back here next week on The Mental Game. And if you watched or listened to that episode, I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Ryan's insight, his thoughtfulness, and his reflection on his mental health, his injury, his past, his future, football, and off the field. It was an incredible conversation, and I can't thank him enough for letting me, like I said, come to his home in Pittsburgh, spend some time with him and his family, and really get to know the person and player he is and was just a great convo, and I'm so excited he came on the mental game here for season two. Coming up next week, once again, I'm not telling you who the guests are until the Sunday before. You can see that on my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, MySpace. If I can get that up and running again, we'll put it on there. But next week, it is a musician, a multi-platinum singer. I am so excited for that conversation. He sat down with me before one of his concerts, and... Then he brought me backstage, and I got to hang out with him after the show. It was a really cool experience. I will present that to you next week as we are right back here every Tuesday on The Mental Game.